Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel. Co-host of Escape from the City on the ABC and partner of Empower Wealth Advisory. Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investors Council of Australia and the founder of Empower Wealth Advisory. Named the 2018 and 2019 Property Advisory Firm of the Year. Stay tuned as they bring you the Insider's Guide to Property, Finance and Money Management. All right, folks, welcome back to the summer series of the Property Couch podcast and welcome back to you too, mate. Oh, mate, I tell you, this is, this is fun. It, it is fun and, and you know, in terms of getting into looking at people's situations and, and seeing their transformations, their money transformations, it's just a real joy. It's a real privilege and, and I hope the community is also enjoying, um, you know, basically being a fly on the wall in these conversations to see how people are organising themselves and, and, you know, the transformation that they're, uh, that they're experiencing because I think that's got to be value for everyone. The real value is in the case studies, isn't it? When you went through a teaching modality, you get the strategy, you get the tactics, but then you want to see the case studies. You want to see real people applying it. And that's the that's the idea of the summer series where we can showcase people's money transformations, see if we can sort of tease out some of the tips and tricks that they're doing to make it work for them. And hopefully people can try it on for size. But, um, mate, there's a couple of things that... Um, uh, want to keep in mind as well that uh, we're giving away a copy of our book aren't we yeah look i mean our best-selling book make money simple again is available for download we are you know we've made this summer series about being in control of the money we've just gone through a very difficult part of the pandemic so we, we do want to make sure that people understand that there is instruction manuals out there in terms of organizing your money and running that system so we're giving away a copy of our best-selling book and that's very easy to get to um, if you just go the propertycouch.com.au forward slash summer series you'll see the links to that and you can choose your own adventure in regards to getting a copy of that best-selling book uh, that's for free um, and the other thing we've also put in there uh, as we start planning for 2021 is our first survey we're actually mm. going out to our community and we're just asking them uh, it's a quick survey about seven minutes we think it'll take you give us some feedback you know keep stop start what are we doing well um, what topics do you want to hear about? Um, and, and us learning about who's in our community is also going to be helpful for us as we, you know, look to provide, you know, make 2021 the best year of our of our podcast ever. So um, if you've got time to complete that, that would be great. Um, there's a little, obviously a little uh, incentive in there, a chance to win a $500 credit voucher uh, a lot that you can research. use. It's a lot on, on our property research platforms. And so that is select residential property search division um, you can use it on dsrdata.com.au locationscore.com.au uh, suburb growth sell or hold um, and some future reports that we're planning to produce in there as well so that's a 500 dollars voucher if you go in to complete the survey so i just wanted to uh, bring that up front you'll hear us uh, talk about it at the end of the show but i just want everyone to know that that's available mm -hmm. if you can spend seven minutes for us give us some feedbacks in terms of how we can improve and and what we're doing well that would be great yeah, well said. Hey, uh, today's episode is a conversation with Max Roman. Max is a sand groper, fellow West Australian. Ben, you have to stick around to see. There might, there may or may not be a link between myself and Max. So you need there to check may, that out. may not be. That's correct. And uh, we talk about investing money. Uh, we talk about um, some of the adversity you need to overcome and how you apply that to money, um, what it's like to have a sea change in this particular interview. Um, so I reckon we should cut to that uh, right now, the chat we have with Max Roman. All right, Ben, we've got a very special guest today. We are chatting with Max Roman, who is a listener of the podcast and is part of our, keen to be part of our summer series around money transformation. So first of all, welcome to the Property Couch, Max. Thanks, Ben, Bryce and Ivis. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Hey, uh, Max, we're, we're super keen to look under the bonnet from your financial journey, uh, and in particular with your use of Money Smarts. Um, but before we, we get specific about that, we want to learn, uh, get our uh, listeners to learn a little bit about you. So, so tell us a bit about your backstory, um, uh, what you do, and, and more, more importantly, uh, what money was like for you growing up as a kid, uh, chatting with your parents. Right. So, yeah, I've always been very keen on investing uh 
learning about investing in the stock market. Uh, property came a little bit later than my interest into shares. Uh, I ended up doing like, if you remember, there was like PIAC and SEAC back in the day of schools. I did uh, some SEAC course on share trading uh, mm. when I was in year eight or nine. It was at a very young age. And so I, I learned from a, I wish I'd done economics, which I didn't do when I was at school. Um, however, you know, the passion sort of professionally came later because I ended up studying financial planning for a little bit um, and also studying mortgage broking, which I might touch on a little bit later. Um, so, yeah, I've always had a real keen passion for investing and, and money, um, not from a, a real pure greed side of things, but just for the fact that I think that you have to go outside of your normal vocation to be able to really make your life comfortable. Mm. Especially if you choose a vocation that's, um, you know, that's just pro provides you with a comfortable income, you know, you can't save your way to, uh, to a comfortable retirement. So it sort of makes sense in that. And, and so where do you think the origins of that story live for you, Max, in terms of, you know, for someone at your age, you know, in year eight, year nine or whatever, looking at doing a share trading course or was was money often discussed inside your household growing up? Yeah, so it, well, as far as the household went, uh, I, w I grew up mainly as an, an only child. I, I have got a, a brother. Um, my mum and dad were scientists. They just worked very diligently at, uh, with their occupations you know, until they retired, they were in the same job for, you know, 30 years. They had a couple of investment properties after speaking of financial planning in the long term, but growing up, it was really not a massive emphasis. And I would, I would like to say, I suppose, I've read a lot of um, what I like to call high performance books. Uh, you know, you probably might have other, other names for the kinds of books you might be thinking of, but um, really focusing on how your mind sort of works around your view of the world. And, and my parents really had that old mentality, I guess you could say, of that you need to work to be able to, to earn money. And so it was not really any anything outside of that. So I never got any influence from my parents about buying stocks or, you know, trading. I think all of that for them was just, you know, was too complicated and too much. And they just wanted to be able to sort of go to work and come home. And then that was how they made their money. So... So yeah, I, I I really don't know exactly how I got the influence that I did have, but I been like that as far as I can remember. So always just interested in in investing. Did, was there an end goal? Like, did you um, was it as was it as rough and raw as I just want to be rich, or did you want to understand the mechanics of it, or did you want to understand how to um, uh, move up in move up? In, what, what was it that that you were actually walking towards with that interest? I, I would say. Yeah, there's probably a, lot, a bit of it about being rich and having, you know, just be able to buy anything, you know, and, and um, you know, seeing seeing people with, you know, a lot of nice things, I suppose, would, would, would be part of it. Uh, but it's also about being comfortable and, um, I guess, you know, having that option, having the ability to just make a choice, um, or have a choice. Yeah, as, as I'll, I'll touch on a bit later, I, I've... I feel that a lot of the things that you've talked about have really, really resonated with me because, and it's validated a lot of the way that I've been thinking. And even before I learned about your um, philosophy for $2,000 a week passive income from investment properties, I was already on track for that just naturally, you know, and I find that buying, and um, I've, I've bought and sold a few investment properties and having properties and having debt and renting out properties and having to go through all of that that you have to go through with that at times it could be stressful but it was also you know it just really worked for me like I enjoyed having that you know it's um, at one stage I did have between my wife and I we had five properties but we have downsized that a little bit and we've restructured due to a few reasons and one of them this is the sea change which is coming up for us which well, is nice you're moving you yeah, moving to a beautiful a part that. of the world mm. Yeah, so we, uh, my wife and I bought my grandparents' property after they passed away and in Doubleview, and it's a big block. It's um, 843 square metres, big house. We had it as an investment property initially for six years, and we planned to move into it and renovate it and, you know, had all these goals 
with this property. But the crack started to surface when there was lots of issues starting to happen. There was, there was some, some issues with the neighbours. We just couldn't get the neighbours to fix like the retaining wall issues and those kinds of things. And then there was issues with leaking roof and so on and so forth until it just got to the point where we thought we're going to have to spend a couple of hundred grand easy just to renovate this place to move into it and be comfortable. And also being a big place, we just wanted to simplify things. Um, you know, a house we've got at the moment that we live in is is a two-story townhouse. And even that sometimes we think, oh, geez, you know, to keep that clean, you know, it's quite a bit of effort. So we ended up, we had our eye on these apartments down in North Fremantle for a long time. And this is great opportunity came up and we've ended up, settlement hasn't happened yet, but we're in the middle of purchasing that apartment. And it probably goes against the grain about a lot of the things you guys talk about. And, uh, but there was a lot of great features about this apartment. Plus it's only five minutes away from where my parents live. And um, I love the beach. You know, it's right on the train line. You know, it just had it ticked a lot of boxes. So for me, it was, and you know, my, my wife as well, very interested in in this particular apartment, and we've just jumped on it. Uh, but you know, subsequently we've we've had to sell our, our property in W for that one. I think I know which one you mean. It's um, right near right near the beach there at Leighton, where it's on that little dog leg as you go up the main highway. Is that right? Yeah, near Bib and Tucker, near mm-hmm. the near the restaurant yep. there on the water. Uh, yep. yeah, yeah, nice that's spot. Great. So, so full lifestyle. So, you know, in terms of investment versus lifestyle, there's some there's some differences there. But if you, you said that your parents work equal money, so and and you've obviously um, accumulated a number of properties over the journey um, and doing and doing well to be able to 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 make that sea change. Did you did you have any transition um, challenges around getting assets to provide you money when you had such a strong upbringing that said work equals money was there any was there any beliefs that you needed to overcome to to be able to be successful or was that a a simple transition for you i i suppose my property story started it's quite an interesting one because i my 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 old boss suggested to do an option to buy contract which is not huge in australia more in the uk and other places around the world, they might do it a bit more. Mm-hmm. And this was back in 2001, 2002, before the property boom in WA. So we entered this option to buy a contract where I would rent out the property that I chose for him to buy for five years and I would pay an extra $100 a week on top of the going rate of rent. And we did a something like an 8.4% increase per year in the property price. So after five years, if I was keen to buy the property, he would match the $100 a week. So double the amount that I put in myself and take that off the purchase price. Or if I was not keen to, to get the property in the, the day, he was just going to refund me the $100 a week I gave him and he'd keep the property. In the end, I was keen to keep the property, but also the property boom happened and 8.4% per annum turned into a lot more at that point in time. And when I purchased the property, it was double it was it was almost two hundred thousand dollars more than the, the agreed appreciation value. So, I did really <laughs> well out of that transaction, yeah. and um, that was in Hamilton Hill that property. Yeah. Um, and I ended up living there and renting that place out. But during that time, I had the option to buy a contract. I also asked my parents to get a, a have a bit of a loan from them to buy another property, which I ended up living in in Chuart Hill, and that was just a little two by one unit. And I ended up selling that within about 18 months and made about 50 grand on that too because of the boom again. I don't regret selling that property. Uh, I, I think at the end of the day, it was probably not the type of having a, a, a unit which was not freehold, being in Australia, there was some you know, complications with that particular place and I was just happy to sort of let that go. But the, with the money that I got, I managed to pay my parents back, got a new bicycle, you know, bought a new computer, had some money to splash around. And so, you know, it was, a, it was a good transaction. And so I, I had a good, really good experience of property probably at an early, I suppose, early on in, in my time that I was investing in property. Yeah, a lot of people uh, would have in that time, Max, wouldn't they? I mean, you know, Perth was bulletproof. The market was moving, you know, considerably well. Everything was going pretty good. But obviously we know what happened after that in terms of the, um, the stalling. But I, want, I, want to, I, I don't want to talk about the portfolio just yet. Can we go back to... Um, the uh, you know the, the upbringing right so here you've got two parents who are leading by example in terms of both scientists uh, both um, dedicated to their work teaching you that you know a career is important um, they brought you up in a in an area that uh, 
that uh, is what we call middle class, lower middle class area. Um, and you went to the same high school um, <laughs> as my co-host here. Is that right? Yes, which I only found out. I knew Bryce was from Perth. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know that he went to Leeming Senior High School, which he mentioned yeah. in episode 303, I think it was. <laughs> yeah. And um, I was just like, oh, so I got the yearbook out and there he is. <laughs> there he is. Now. So have you got that yearbook? Because I'll get you to take a photo. <laughs> I, need, I need something to tease him at our Christmas party. So I yeah. think that's probably a nice little piece of work. But, um, yeah, so you had to put up. Now, was he, did he? Did he, you know, was he strutting around the corridors of power or was he was he a sort of quiet, shy type that he keeps telling us on the podcast that he's an introvert or was he, you know, was he on the basketball court, you know, trash talking people? <laughs> Tell me a bit about uh, what your memories are of, of my wonderful co-host. So, yeah, I suppose Leeming was quite a big school and he, Bryce was a year older than me. Um, I don't specifically remember seeing him around, but... Um, is that uh, looking at the... Is that what you're telling me? That... <laughs> no, I'm, I'm actually happy to jump in. I was forgettable. Like if, if people, if you know, I, I, if anyone's listening to this, the, you know, if, if, if you were to survey my school um, classmates and who is the most likely to be uh, in the position that I am, I would not be anywhere near on the top 10, right? So I was unremarkable. I was I was middle of the road. And, and so I, I am... I should be the poster child for anyone who's who can who can um, take the fact that if I can do it, I mean, I'm a, I'm a middle class family, lower lower end of middle class. I mean, I you remember Max? I lived in Bibber Lake, so I had to I had to, I had to ride up the hill into the Easterly on the way to school, and then you think, <laughs> oh, that's great, you get the Easterly behind. No, well, the Fremantle doctor would come in in the afternoon. I'd be riding against that on the way home, so I was on the wrong side of the tracks. And I guess that then probably it started just snowing, and you know, then the world started <laughs> caving in, and you know, we had to... yeah, you got it right. So you've heard the story. So, so the thing is, I'm I'm the I'm the antithesis of um, what you would think uh, success looks like as a high school. So I'm not surprised that Max doesn't remember me, um, <laughs> because. Uh, but you do was... mention you do mention about the school that there were some great teachers, but there were also some some teachers that weren't necessarily, you know, teaching you what you wanted to learn and so forth. And you make a point which I resonated with in terms of that, you you know, that that you weren't sure about what you could do with your life prior, to, you know, coming out of high school, right? Because you, did, you, you felt like maybe I just got an average education and so, you know, how was I to improve on that? Can you share a little bit more about that story with the community in terms of, what made you feel that way? And obviously, you've, you've shared with us a little bit about the results you've got in terms of building a portfolio. But I want to dig into that piece of the story in terms of, because you've obviously done it well for yourself. So tell us a bit about um, when did you realise that, or you know, how did you overcome that challenge as if you didn't think you had an, a good enough education that would allow you to, to be the person that you are today? Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. Um, I, I think that when I was at high school, I, I didn't know really what I wanted to do when I left. And my <laughs> my parents being so, uh, scientists and academics as well, they were keen for me to, you know, probably go to university. And then I would say to their dismay when I uh, ended up uh, leaving school to, to do pastry cooking at TAFE, probably wasn't what they expected. Um, and so I ended up doing a, a pre-apprenticeship or half a pre-apprenticeship, and then I got an apprenticeship at Woolies at Bull Creek. Uh, mm -hmm. I was a transportation cooking. engineer at Woolies at Bull Creek, otherwise known as a trolley boy. Were you really? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Maybe around a different time because, I, I mean, I was stuck in the back there in the bakery, but then I ended up leaving the apprenticeship after three months because I realised getting up at five in the morning and, uh, you know, allergies with flour and everything like that didn't really work. <laughs> no. and, um, and so I ended up working the fruit and veg section for about a year. And then I joined the Navy from there. So I always had a bit of an interest in the military. And and, and so I, I joined the Navy when I was 19. That just opened my world up a, a lot, I would say. But going back a step, I do remember my boss at Woolies in the fruit and veg section saying to me, he was mad keen on property. And he was saying to me when I was only 18 years old, you've got to buy properties, go buy properties. And I was like, yeah. And all my thoughts were back then was, and if you remember back in you know 1994, this is, it was so hard to borrow money then. You'd have to have, you know, show savings worth of you know, six or 12 months worth of solid savings. You'd have to 
you know, interest rates were, like, you probably had to tell me, but they were um, you know, upwards of Quite probably high. 10% back then. <laughs> and, and so yeah, it, yeah. it wasn't something, there was only one friend of mine that I remember who walked out of high school and started buying properties. He ended up having about five properties himself by the time he was about 20. But then I also remember him, and this is a classic story about someone who is really dedicated about doing something like this. We'd go to the pub to catch up for a beer and he'd bring an apple would have a, like a pub lunch and he'd bring his apple and that's how he would save his money. <laughs> so mm, he'd still have mm, a beer, but he, mm. he wouldn't eat, he wouldn't eat a pub meal. Um, yeah. So he's very, you know, he's very frugal. frugal. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, like you say, I, I was, I was I probably just, you know, the average sort of person who, you know, I joined the Navy, I guess, which is, you know, not say it's like an, an average job, but you know, was, the pay was, was okay. Got to travel and experience a lot of things, but like a lot of us at that young age as well, temptation to go out and party every weekend and didn't want to sort of miss out on a lot of opportunities and good times with your friends and, and um, you know, then all the travelling and everything else that went with it. So, you know, throwing $200 over a bar on a Friday night was a pretty sort of normal thing. And and I think back, you know, thinking like, wow, if, if I just – all those nights and all those hangovers, I could have probably all done of without sudden, some of them. mate who just had his, had, his, <laughs> had his apple was a pretty clever yeah. guy, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, That's right. yeah, he's probably retired now. We're all sitting here going, "How did he do?" He that owns role? the orchard. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so uh, you, yeah. you've learned, you've learned coming out of school. But the the fact that you decided not to go on to tertiary education didn't, you know, didn't define you, right? I mean, ultimately, you you were still working out who you were as a person and and where you know where you fit into the world. And that's a message for all of our community in terms of. Just if you don't get the grades in school and you don't get the career that you thought you were going to get, that's life is long. Um, you know, we're all going to have multiple careers, um, and you'll you'll find your niche. So, so you, you've gone into the navy. Tell us what happens next. So I spent about four and a half years uh, in the uh, surface fleet when uh, went to sea on a couple of different warships, and then. Um, but I was always keen to join the submarine service. So I, I ended up uh, applying and was selected to join the submarines, which meant I came back to Perth as well because our training and everything was here and we're based, our submarine squadron's based here. Garden Island, is it? At Garden Island. Yep. Uh, I, did, I did six months of the training ashore and then I was posted to my first submarine, which was HMAS Deshano, one of the Collins class submarines. The training was fantastic. Just the environment, the camaraderie, it was all just awesome. Um, I loved it. You know, my first day at sea, I was on I was on the submarine for about two hours, and I was just waiting to be tasked. And in, oh, they have uh, extra beds uh, overflow for extra sailors at the in the weapon storage compartment at the front of the submarine, where there's like a three and a half ton torpedo hanging over your bed, <laughs> um, and then there, there's like the um, missiles and torpedoes in this weapon storage compartment, and then there's there was a storage pod, which is the same dimensions as a torpedo on the port side of the submarine. And it was, we were heading we were about two hours south of Rottnest, heading towards Tasmania. We are doing a trip to Launceston. And um, the submarine was rocking back and forth. And I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And this storage pod came off its rack and crushed my legs. <laughs> mm. And um, I... Uh, then it, then submarine rolled back the other way and I managed to get myself out of there. And then someone heard my expletives and came and gave me first aid and uh, they they had to stop the sub and medivac me off. And I ended up um, ripping all the muscle in my left leg in my VMO and then um, t- hurt my back and did my right leg as well. Um, spent about two and a half months um, recovering where I couldn't bend my knee. And that was the end of my submarine career. Um, before it began, that, unbelievable. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I ended up um, uh, just becoming an instructor at the submarine school and did that for about two years before I was medically discharged. And in the end, medically discharged with with PTSD. But you know, I was just I was you know I, I found it was just um, uh, uh, what what was a safe environment for me being in a submarine and you know being in a warship was you know didn't feel as that safe anymore because this completely unexpected thing happened which you know should never have happened mm. um but the, the navy were fantastic you know uh, department of veteran affairs when i was discharged were fantastic and i have a very spooky story in regards to one of your uh, guests that you had uh episode 238 which was uh um the and i actually i ended up emailing you after that episode because i um 
I was listening to the episode just coming off the train and luckily there was no one around and I was like nearly bawling my eyes out listening to this story because it was about a guy, um, Men- Mendoza, I can't remember his first mm-hmm. name, sorry. Um, John. 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 His nephew was in the Navy as well and was mm-hmm. um, in the submarines and he, yeah, that was Jeff Mendoza, his nephew. And, and the name rang a bell, but I was just like, oh, I can't put a name to the face. And, you know, you meet hundreds of people. And um, so, yeah, because that story resonated with me a lot because of the the whole situation where he had PTSD and then he ended up taking his life. But as we're packing up to move to our f- apartments in, in North Fremantle, I've um, gone through some things and I found this business card wallet and I was looking through it just going, oh, yeah, this is from, from quite a long time ago and I've got Jeff Mendoza's business card in here. I must have met him at some stage, uh. probably had some connection at some stage. I just can't remember how I met him, but, you know, just like, wow, when I, when I saw that in there, I was, yes, it was, it was quite a, quite a full on sort of experience to, because, <laughs> because, mm-hmm. because that episode really did impact me when I listened to it and listening to that story, you know, the unfortunate thing that happened with him after he, he left and, um, and, you know, psychology, I think for me in terms of investing is such an important thing. And, and, you know, I was, I was really, really keen to hear, we had, you know, a psychologist and psychology brought into the whole thing with investing and, and, you know, having properties because it can be tough at times, you know, when you're dealing with difficult tenants or difficult property managers, <laughs> difficult mm. situations with the house, like, mm. you know, every week there some, seems to be something breaking and you've, you've got to be able to try and manage that. Um, so, so yeah, like it's, it's really great that you're, you're covering all those different bases when it comes to investment. Yeah, a lot of people have reached out and said that that episode was um, something that uh, was an episode that impacted them. So um, thanks for sharing that. And um, yeah, clearly that's that's not an ideal uh, story for you for your for your legs. Are you? Uh, what's what's the impact of that now? I'm I'm pretty good. I mean, I get the odd sore back, um, mm. but um, um, yeah, mostly I you know was, was able to run again after a few years and do all that. Like, you know, I've always been a keen runner, and you know. I love exercising and I ended up joining the Air Force, funnily enough, for the Air Force Reserves. For, I did that for about seven and a half years after the Navy. So, you know, I was still able to, to serve and I ended up doing about 15 years in the military all up. So, yeah, it was it, it was just something that I had a keen interest in and um, mm-hmm. I'm done with that now, retired from there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, but now just working for, for the government in, in IT and, um, you know, it's a, a lot more safer <laughs> what I'm doing Yeah. Now. <laughs> yeah, well, well, there's no Victorians coming over. You won't open the border, so at least you're uh, <laughs> at least at least you're COVID safe. Hey, um, if we could pivot to um, money management, because um, clearly we could go down the tangent with what you just talked about for for quite some time. Um, what what does what did basic money management look like for you? Because you know you've you've given us backstory, mum and dad. Um, you've given us backstory on how you uh, got into uh, property. You've also talked about how it's been quite successful for you. Can you help us uh, better understand the nuts and bolts of, you know, you transition from the family uh, home into your own home and with your own family. What did money management look like back then? And was it working for you? And I'm, I'm talking about the nuts and bolts of um, cash flow management in the house, not necessarily investing here. I, I was a, a, a terrible saver. I was mm-hmm. absolutely horrendous at saving and always wanting to buy latest gadgets. You know, I, I, I just... Um, uh, you know, I just remember this guy coming to high school actually saying, you know, if you set, if you save 10% of everything you earned by the time you retire, you know, you put that money aside and able to appreciate, you know, 8% power, compound, compound interest, yeah, yep. then, yep. you know, you'd be extremely wealthy and geez, I wish I'd really listened to that guy, you know, and, um, <laughs> and now I just think, geez, it's so, it's so easy to do that. Once you, once you realize, and once you, you know, take away that money, not even see it to start with. So, you know, I, I ended up investing the stock market quite a bit and actually did a bit, uh, I was doing more like day trading and trading in CFDs and options and came a bit unstuck with that and did lose quite a bit of money doing that. After I was successful. You're not alone. Yeah. You're not alone for most of the uneducated punters out there. That happens. Yep. Yeah. And so I, I've taken it back. So I've, I've become a lot less aggressive with how I deal with money and, um, I've actually got onto some fantastic micro investing apps, like Spaceship and Raise. If you've heard of those, because there's no brokerage fees, there's no fees for doing each transaction. You know, you can put in as little as you want, as often as you like. So, you know, I found some really amazing things through having, you know, uh, adversity through going through a lot of issues with, uh, you know, losing money, and you know, it made me 
look more into like, well, how can I make this easier and not have stress where you're up at three in the morning trying to, you know, pull off a good trade and, you know, and then, you know, seeing all the money just dissolve away because you got into a bad trade and this, you know, there's some, there's some great things out there which doesn't really take a lot of commitment from people. You don't have to have $5,000 to invest and, you know, you don't have to be spending a lot of money on brokerage fees. There's, there's some really great options for people right now. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned that, um, that so you, you mentioned you're a podcast listener. Um, what, what was it that you were looking for when you were searching for uh, property related information? Were you, were you listening to other podcasts? What, what, what was, what was the call for you to improve your education around property? I think I've read quite a lot of the books like Jan Summers, um, Paul Clitheroe, you know, read quite a few books on investing um, and the strategies that maybe used to, to work in terms of um, strategy where you buy a property every once a year and you get to, you know, to 10 years and you have 10 investment properties and you, you use the equity that's built up, you know, that, as we all know, that philosophy is probably gone by the wayside now. But when I, when I got onto your podcast, you actually talked a lot more sense and, and you know, podcasts are great because, you know, I can listen to it on the train and able to listen to it to, to, to what, what you're, you're talking about and then also follow up by reading uh, what you put on Facebook and on, on your websites and, and all of that. With, um, you know, having a, a two-year-old daughter and all those types of things, it's very hard to just sit down and read a book these days. So it's just um, – I can't, I, you know, I, I can't sort of go past having having this podcast that you guys almost fulfil all of that now for me because you talk about concurrent things. So yeah, I could read a book that was written ten years ago, but it doesn't apply now. So you know, and you know, the updates with the RBA announcements and all of that is is really great. And you know, and I resonate a lot with the way that you think. So I've promoted your podcast a lot to a lot of my friends and family, and and I talk about you know just how you guys have just you know hit the nail on the head with it. So you know, I applaud you for that. So, Max, we've jumped around a lot in this conversation, which has been fascinating. I mean, those stories are amazing. Obviously, you 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 would have got discipline and structure in working in the Navy and, and potentially some of the work you did in the Air Force. Have you carried any of that through in terms of because what I'm getting a sense of is you've tried, you put your hand in the water a couple of times, you've been burned a couple of times. I'm trying to get a I'm trying to get a, a better picture here of of when did we, because you've traded property as well to a degree by the sounds of things. So, so you've been medically discharged and you're looking for that new opportunity. Um, talk me through in terms of you get a maybe a lump sum or a payout or something along those lines or a pension. Then you've got obviously to get other work to do. So take us through sort of how you're setting up and planning for that money. And then, you know, how did you, how did you build up and execute on that wealth story. Definitely that first property, uh, having the equity from that first property gave me a leg up to then be able to buy three more properties from there. Yeah. Uh, well, ended up buying the place we're living in now, we subdivided. So, you know, we had enough equity to be able to borrow and with my wife and I both working and both earning reasonable amount of income, but not nothing yep. crazy. Yep. Um, nice we're solid to, double household income. Yep. Yeah, yeah, and no kids at the time. Yep. Um, we were able to to buy our first home together, so we still had the properties in individual names each, and then we put, bought the first house together, and then subdivided, built this place we're living in now. You know, kept the other place that was a rental, and then also bought my grandparents' place, which we've now just sold. Yep. But um, so at one stage, yeah, we had had those five properties at once. We were managing, and it was it was a really good time. There was, you know, uh, at that time the rental market was really great. So we're talking six about six years ago. There, there was a really good time there, um, yeah. and then things started Until to go. About 2014. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and then the rental, you know, went down about two hundred dollars a week. Um, mm. you know, and in the Hamilton Hill property, I had. So you know, we had to weather depreciation on the rental income, and and um, but having having that equity initially really gave us a leg up. A lot of people probably say like, oh, well, it's really hard to do that these days. But I think if you if you focus on and building that equity up and, you know, I'm a pretty big advocate of principal interest loans as well. And, you know, you pay, you pay down that, then it does give you so much more leverage to be able to move on and then get the next property. And that's where your Money Sparts platform comes into it because it, it's fantastic for a product that you're giving to people to be able to use. It's fantastic to be able to manage all of that. 
So, so given you've got, and yeah, you know, I like the word you use, depreciation, because I think that's a nice story to tell yourself. But it's let's let's face it, it's a deduction in rent. Um, <laughs> so, so you get this deduction in rent. Your cash flow is getting a little bit challenged in terms of that. Property prices have gone down in Perth, and you know over that time that you know to today they've probably gone down about twenty five percent. Generalising, of course. Um, did you have some tough cash flow moments there, and 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 in using the platform and using Money Smarts, did did that give you some confidence around, you know, sort of how how you were going to get through the other side? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, you know graphically displays where your shortfalls are and then where you need to tighten up and and then realise, you know, I really don't need to budget for that. But also, more importantly, it's about how you spend your money, not about how you save your money as well. And so you have to look at everything that you spend on. You cannot forget every single dollar because, you know, you, you might not factor in a holiday, for example, which is where we've possibly come unstuck a couple of times where we've gone and booked a nice big holiday. That wasn't in the budget. So then you've got to try and make amends with that. So it's you know, really important to say, like, if you want to go away, and you know, we're not, no one's traveling overseas at the moment, but if you want to travel anywhere and stay anywhere, you've got to be realistic about what that's actually going to cost, what that's going to look like, even to the, to the point where you might sort of break it down per day for the accommodation, food, drinks, whatever you're going to be doing when, once, when you're on holidays. And I think that's what gets a lot of people unstuck is that they, they miss those things that are spur of the moment or not captured properly. Mm. You flagged Money Smarts there, Max. Uh, can you tell us um, what led you to want to adopt that and what was life like before you implemented Money Smarts and what's it, what's it looking like now that you have implemented Money Smarts? Well, I can throw away everything, any other budgeting spreadsheet that I've ever had to use. And, <laughs> and you know, it's just this one platform which ties everything together. And the funniest thing is before you brought in Money Fit, being in IT myself, I thought, well, it'll be great to have an app to see how you're going, comparing yourselves to, to you know, what, how you're actually tracking with your, 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 um, you know, everything that you, you, you can track with your, your, what you've got there in MoneyFit pretty much is exactly what I thought of. Was, uh, it would be great to have an app like that. And you've, you've done it. You've actually created it. So it's, yeah. And, and um, so, you know, it's good to see all of the different features that you've got in there. And it's really easy to use, you know, the developers you've got there must be great like to be able to do that. Yeah, and I've got to update it because it's, things are changing. So it's a bit probably a bit out of date right now at, at this point in time. But I think there's a, there's a need to have financial planners and having that, um, you know, especially for people that really just don't understand how they can do the best for themselves. But your platform just gives you a lot of an edge if, you, if you're not committed to go to a financial plan. You, you know, your platform provides so much that, you know, you might – be able to, to gain from seeing a financial planner, what I'm trying to say. The idea the idea of this series too, Max, is uh, someone might be listening to this and they they haven't implemented Money Smarts at all and they're not sure what the platform is and everything that you're talking about. So I wonder if you could, uh, and you said, oh, look, I've thrown away all my, my spreadsheets, uh, don't use them anymore. Can you give us, uh, well, can you give our community of listeners a bit of an insight into why you were able to throw the spreadsheets away and what a difference that's kind of making for you now to to be on top of your money so that you can actually head towards your goals because then I'll ask you shortly what your uh, what your end goal is. Well, I think firstly, you've got to find something that works and you've, or you've got to create something yourself. Whereas, you know, you've thought about everything pretty much with the smart money smart. So it's all there to prompt you to go, you know, oh yeah, you've got to, spend money on this 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 and this and then it allows you to also put in all of your assets all of your expenditure you know it ties everything together and then provides you a dashboard which people love dashboards um and you know i know that as well from my job that you know it's Thank all about you dashboards. Started. keep it simple <laughs> keep it simple that's what people want yep. yeah and 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 you can say like you know you could you could use that as a mechanism to say oh no i need to i want that to look better than what that looks like at the moment so you know if you put everything in as accurately as possible then it will spit out a very accurate picture of where you're at and where you might want to go get to yeah nice and and so the idea is so that you can trap more surplus uh do it in 10 minutes a month and actually uh say goodbye to micromanaging every dollar and sort of having a global view so that you can actually have some some peace around 
you know what you can spend and 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 sort of when you're spending money you don't have to have any guilt did, did has that helped you at all max just going well i've now projected a 12 month look i know how much i'm um spending in these silos has it made a difference to you and your family around um confidence around making spending decisions stopping the slippage give us some of the brass tacks of the of the the, the day-to-day from adopting money smarts I probably need my my wife to have access to see it more, and mm-hmm. um, I guess we've tried a couple of other apps in the past to track like our shopping budget and you know what our budget is. Everything is very cumbersome when it comes to that. To, to you know, and you talk about ten minutes a month, like you know, that's where you should be really. That's where your end goal should be is that you don't want to be spending hours a week punching in numbers like you went shopping and did this and you, you went and bought that and so forth you know you spend money on this it's it's very hard to keep up on that so it really is you know i i I think i need to probably promote it a bit more with the family but it it really is a lot more helpful to have that all there and you have your you know your jars and doing all of the different ways like using your different accounts so we have set up different accounts to be able to have different spending um, you know have um you know yeah income your bills and uh, holiday account and different things like that. The provisioning um, jars, yep. Yeah, provisioning and, jars. And, and just for your benefit, I mean, and for the community's benefit, the, the secondary household member can now log in. So there is a secondary right. um, ability to log into the same household because that is always the way with these traditional mobile apps. It's like the app's on your phone and no one else can really get into it. So yes. having the second user to come into the same household is, yeah, is an enhancement that we made at the middle of this year um, to uh, to be able to allow for both of you to uh, to have login access to your to your financial affairs. So that's a, a nice little enhancement there as well. Yeah, great. Max, what would you say to someone who's uh, listened to this, they're hearing you, it's um, made a difference in your life, it's made it really simple, throw away all the spreadsheets. What would you say to them uh, for someone who's considering maybe um, getting rid of their old system and, and embracing this? What What would be your encouragement to them? Oh, you've got absolutely nothing to lose. You know, you've got everything to gain. You, you, mm. you, you've got to do it. You've got to try it. My, my my boss, for example, the other day was talking about doing his budget and I said, oh, here's a link. Get onto this. Not going to cost you anything and you'll see some massive benefits and then, you know, from there you'll see other fantastic things that, you know, from from that, that you know, you know, get onto your Facebook page and get into the community and talk about, like, the different ways people do things with money. Um, yeah. And so... Oh, yeah, I, I can't. Inc- I, I, there's nothing else that I would use, and I do, and I do use now. It's the only thing that I use for budgeting, and and well, I know you don't like to say budgeting as such. Sorry, but um, the, the only thing that we use to be able to capture our income coming in and our expenses going out, and then being able to understand the, the holistic picture of you know where we're at, and then also with the um, money stretch, that's something I still need to tweak. With the, especially with the move and the changes that we're going through, but you know the, the unknown expenses and and being able to understand if the unknown expenses come up, how much you have left, how much you know powder you've got left in the keg to be able to use. Yeah, that's very helpful. You you mentioned um, that budgeting might be taboo. It's it's not taboo to us. We just think the budgets alone don't work. We had uh, James Clear. Budget, yeah. We had James Clear, who was the author of Atomic Habits, on our podcast about this, this time last year. Um, and he talked about the fact that you don't rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your system. And it kind of kind of means if you if you have a goal, which is your budget, if you have no system that underpins the budget, you you will actually it'll slip away and then you won't get to where you want to do. So we kind of feel like budgets are still important because money money smart still operates around having a budget or an idea of where we want to um, plan our money. But it, but it underpins it with a, a system, a rules-based system that allows you to, to uh, make unconscious decisions or you've made conscious decisions at the beginning of the year so that then the unconscious decisions fall within that system. And I think that probably uh, hopefully gives people who aren't using Money Smarts who are listening to this a, an opportunity to see how, how it fits into budgeting. And you, you pointed out before it doesn't cost you anything. You're right, we've set it up for free so that people can actually control their money it's our contribution to our community so that if they become better money managers they can then trap more surplus and they can actually make a difference which fulfills uh you know some of the values and some of the goals that we have as a as a as a as individuals ben and i but also as a business so um 
What can I can I ask you, um, Max? What's the point? What what's the end goal for you? What what is it that you're? Why 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 bother getting your money in order? Why bother um, investing your money? What what's the end game for you? It is to be comfortable to not rely on the government whatsoever, and I've always thought like that. I think that having to rely on the pension or even you know it doesn't even come into it for me. I um, I've obviously got your super. And you know you can get a, an annuity when you retire, and you can have a pension from that. But in terms of a you know government pension, it's it's never been something that I have ever desired to ever want. And you know I felt guilty when I was getting pension for the uh, the accident I had when I was medically discharged. Don't feel guilty. <laughs> You're serving our nation. Don't feel guilty. Thanks. Mm. Um, and you know, um, it, and it's just been about like trying to get have the most comfortable passive income that you can have. And I mean, like $2,000 a week is a great figure to work towards. And it would be nice to go for more. But I think $2,000 a week is achievable. And over time, I think, you know, three or four good investment properties, it should be able to do it for you. So, so my final question for, for you, Max, and thank you so much for your time today. It's been, you know, very insightful in terms of the challenges that have been put in front of you, um, you know, you, you were looking to have a, a very big career and you, you have an accident and you've had to pivot and you've had further careers and now you find yourself in the IT industry. Um, and Bryce, you know, was the right question to ask in terms of why do it? Well, it's obviously, yeah, to 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 self-fund your retirement, which makes perfect sense to me. So what what do you what would you say to someone who's who's thinking, should I give it a go? What are what are some of the tips that you can give our community around why should they give it a go? Um, to see where they can get to in terms of their financial transformation. Uh, you, you're talking specifically about money smarts. No, no. Well, and money smarts, but also you know general wealth creation. Like, why should I? Why should I? Why should try? I not wait around for the pension? Mm. Yeah, I think that you know that your lifestyle will be so much enhanced from having you know a, a, a cash flow which is you know something that you may be used to whilst when you're in your working life. Mm. Um, and you know, it, also for me, it's about leaving a legacy for my daughter and my family, yeah. um, and hoping that you know she won't have to worry when she gets to an older age because we've already done a lot of that setting up for her. But I still want to make sure that she like knows how to make her own way in the world. How to fish? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. And um, so, yeah, it's it's just vitally important to have passive income generated i mean look you know if people throw all of their money into super then there's still you know opportunities when they retire to engage a buyer's agent to find that right property for an example and set themselves up with a couple of properties you know at the moment the rents are going through the roof it, and if, if you're not aware which you probably are but wa there are people lining up to try and find rentals because it, it, it is the, the, the lowest vacancy rate that we've almost ever had and so it does go through a bit of boom and bust with the, the amount of money you get for rentals. But um, yeah, geez, at the moment, it's people are struggling to find a place to rent. Um, and there's something else I wanted to add about investing into shares. So at the moment, you know, a lot of companies have completely stripped their dividends or they've reduced their dividends to a very minute amount compared to what they might have paid previously. And with property, for me, it has been a solid investment vehicle. I've done better out of property than any other investment vehicle. And I've gained, you know, in terms of yield, it's still gaining at the moment, but it's solid. It doesn't drop overnight from five or 6% down to 1% like it does with stocks. So, um, and I'm also a big believer in diversification and diversification has also allowed me to weather the losses I've made on the stock market. And I, I still feel comfortable, you know, I'm I'm not sitting here tearing my hair out and I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I'm still maintaining a very happy existence because I feel that I've set myself up right from a younger age. But also, I don't think that, again, it's, you know, I'm 44 now and it's not too late for people to be able to get into it. If they can, you know, Money Smarts is there to help them to be able to get to there as well. Mm. Yep, agreed. So, hey, look, I, I think uh, I think you're a credit to you, you your parents and your, your family, uh, Max, that you are... Uh, very firm on the fact that you're not going to rely on the pension. I don't think that's going to happen with you. Um, and you're well on your way to a comfortable passive income using your portfolio. So I guess for you and I probably need to to shout out to, I'm, I'm the class of 92, you're the class of 93. We should shout out to the alumni and say, 
you know, if you and I can create a passive income through our portfolios, they can do it as well. So uh, there you go. If you're if you're listening to this and you're from Leeming Senior High School, <laughs> there's no excuses. We got gotcha. you. <laughs> but um, yeah, but, but I, I guess it's always it's always humbling for Ben and I to have someone put their hand up and say they're prepared to share their own story. Um, we kind of hope that through what we're doing, we're we're hopefully normalising having conversations around money at the dinner table. And we hope that we contribute to a generation of conversations around the dinner table. But from the generation that we grew up in, Max, that wasn't necessarily the norm. So um, well done on on your contribution to our community today. And um, we appreciate you coming on the Property Couch. Thanks very much. And Thanks, I really Max. appreciate everything you guys are doing. And um, yeah, just look forward to many more episodes. Please, please don't stop anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear that, Stiggy? You've got plenty of work still out here. But, um, uh, we appreciate it. Good on you, Max. Yeah, thanks for coming thanks, on Max. today. Thanks very much. Catch ya. Well, there you go, Ben. Uh, the fellow alumni from my, <laughs> from yeah. my high school. I was uh, nice when he reached out to us and says, I think I was the year under Bryce at the same high school. I thought, ooh, I could get some dirt on Bryce here. <laughs> uh, no, all good. He obviously didn't remember you. You're that sort of memorable person. We can understand that. <laughs> I know, just yep. kidding. I look, look, had some challenges along the way that we that we learned about, but hasn't given up on the dream of creating financial peace, um, and that is inspiring. Like he's had to adjust careers because of a, a work injury, uh, but again, um, continues to keep showing up and trying to find a pathway through education and then action. So uh, to Max and his a partner and, and obviously a daughter there. Exciting times ahead uh, for them in terms of their uh, their journey to uh, to financial peace. Good on you, Max. We appreciate you coming on the Property Couch. Uh, we appreciate getting some insights into your world, your backstory and your investing. And it was really, really interesting. We hope that our community found that uh, to be the case also, Ben. But uh, mate, until next week. Enjoy your summer because knowledge is empowering, but only if you act on it. See you, folks, see you next week. Hey there folks, Bryce here again, hoping that you're enjoying each and every one of these amazing transformation stories on the summer series. Now, I just wanna remind you that these transformations are available for you too. All you need to do is go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash summer series, and there you'll be able to download a free copy of our best-selling book, Make Money Simple Again, which is the instruction manual on how to implement Money Smarts. And you'll also have instructions on how to use our free My Wealth Portal that brings it all together and shows you how to implement this money transformation in your life. So I certainly want to encourage you to do that. Now, 2021, we plan to be the best year we've ever had on the podcast. And so we want to hear from you. So if you go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash summer series, there is a survey that you can fill out and let us know the guests, the topics, the ideas, anything that you want to hear talked about on The Property Couch. We certainly want to hear from you. So that's thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash summer series. And if you complete that, you'll go into the draw to win a $500 voucher with select residential property for you to use on any research uh, product of your choice. So I'd certainly want to encourage you to fill that out. And just a little reminder that nothing we have talked about on any of these podcasts constitutes financial advice. Of course, you should consult your suitably qualified financial advisor to help you talk about your unique circumstances. Now, folks, I want to encourage you to go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash summer series.